Hello everyone, the theme of my presentation is Heritage Conservation Perspectives and uh, I will be talking about the conservation contestant issues regarding the Daupurvatiya site in Assam. The Daupurvatiya site um, is situated in the uh, western part of the city of Tejpur, which is uh, situated in the Indian state of Assam. So, uh, as we know, um, the protection and care of tangible cultural heritage is called conservation and uh, conservation is undertaken to maintain or increase the benefit from an object be it uh, monetary and, uh, and or non-monetary and uh, non-monetary values can be cultural values such as identity, artistic, technical or rarity values or socio-economic values such as functional, educational or political values uh, these values are um, attributed to historical objects or uh, sites. Um, they do not occur naturally and it is credited to human beings in a socio-cultural context. It is the result of human thought and so conservation should include the social and cultural processes which an object has undergone in order to include practical concerns instead of uh, it being only uh, based on theoretical reasoning. In the context of conservation, these, va these values are usually at stake because there is conflict between continuity and change. There is variation of opinion between um, what material components should be stagnated or stabilized and uh, which social and cultural processes should be allowed to be continued um, that aid in the reproduction and development of the society. Moreover, the attribution of these values is a subjective process which makes conservation of such objects all the more complicated. The process of conservation consists of sub-steps such as cleaning, stabilization, repair and restoration. All conservation processes, however, may not include all of these steps. Cleaning means clearing up the surface area of an object in order to enhance its detail, whether it be texture, color or topography. Cleaning brings up the issue of dirt which uh, might have accumulated on the object during different times and processes which will in turn determine whether and or how much they should be cleaned. The different deposits on an object may be of the different, uh, the following type. Dirt which is accumulated in the museum that is since the object was first collected. Dirt which accumulated when the object was in use that is between manufacture and collection. Deposits applied intentionally during use soil deposits on archaeological objects, alteration on products arising from chemical changes to the object. Stabilization is um, sometimes also referred to as uh, preservation or preventive conservation in which further deterioration of the object is checked. This is usually done by setting the environment that is temperature, relative humidity, light, human contact, etc. surrounding the object to acceptable parameters. Uh, but in case of some objects made of materials such as ceramics and porous stones, their composition might be altered in order to prevent their condition from worsening. Removal of uh, certain such elements may change the makeup of the object and it is an irreversible action, but it is often carried out in the interest of protecting the artwork or archaeological object. When an object has dismantled, the rejoining of its parts is called uh, repairing. Repairing to sometimes is an irreversible process and it also may sometimes change the overall look of the object. Repairing is also questionable when the cause behind the breakage of the object is considered. Restoration sometimes uh, involves irreversible processes such as gap filling, repairing, uh, restoring missing pieces, etc. Since these involve permanent changes, they are the most contested conservation processes. They also bring into question whether the restoration is uh, really being done in order to safeguard the longevity of the object or is it being done for aesthetic purposes. This question is important in order to justify the act of restoration. However, this is just one issue. Um, other naysayers may also uh, bring up the importance of deterioration as part of the history of the object and challenge any changes to it or its prevention. As already mentioned, the conservation process may involve some or all of these steps, but uh, what determines the selection of these steps is the way the condition and damage of an object is viewed at by people. Damage is subject to observer and context, so while a particular, 
object may be considered to be damaged by an art historian, it may not be seen so by the public. It may be seen as a change which the object has undergone under the natural process of life. And they are right from that perspective because not all change is damaged and it is the viewpoint of some communities that certain objects are meant to change and die over years and not be frozen in time. While some other communities may be of the opinion that if an object is meant for a certain purpose, it should be used, uh, disregarding the damage or change that may occur during its course. And indeed, in some cases, use does increase the benefit of an object, for if an object was to be stored away only to be preserved, then it uh, might well not exist. On the other hand, it is also true that most damage occurs due to use. Therefore, a single viewpoint is not enough to arrive at an acceptable rate of damage. So the uh, site which I'll be talking about is uh, called the Dog Parvatiya site and it has architectural remains which date back to the 6th century CE and the site is um, a very small village which is uh, located in West Tejpur in the Indian state of Assam. Uh, Assam which is situated in the northeastern part of India is uh, home to some of the earliest rock cut cave architecture which has been dated between 300 or 200 BCE and 100 CE by some scholars. However, although sculptural art representing gods, goddesses and divine figures are found in abundance across the state, no sculptural art dating to before the 5th century CE are found. It is surmised that sculptural activities began in Assam with the expansion of the Gupta Empire. The Gupta period existing from approximately 240 to 590 CE is considered to be the classical period of Indian art and architecture, along with a relatively stable political, economic and social environment. Art architecture as well as other fields of study flourished extensively. So uh, sculptural remains belonging to the 5th century CE period have been found at Dao Parvatiya, uh, Mikir Ati, Borganga, Kamakha and Dudnoi. The site that will be studied in the current context, the, the Dao Parvatiya site, uh, uh, is home to some monumental stone art. It has the remains of a 6th century temple. Uh, during the Ahom period, uh, that is during 13th century to 19th century CE, a Shiva temple was built over the Gupta period temple. In 1897, however, a major earthquake occurred in Assam which destroyed the Shiva temple and the ruins of the Gupta period temple underneath were exposed. So this is the front and the rear view of the site and um, this is the door jam uh, which was exposed after the uh, earthquake that occurred in Assam and the Shiva Linga it dates back to the Ahom period uh, Shiva temple which was built over the original temple. And the ruins of the Ahom period temple are in the form of a sanctum, sanctorum and a pavilion. The ruins of the original temple include two upright door gems and seal made of stone bearing images of the river goddesses Ganga and Yamuna standing on a crocodile and a tortoise respectively. Other images include Surya, Lakulisha, attendants, geese, flora, etc. Some of the images have partially eroded which makes their identification dubious. The relief sculptures at this site share the characteristics of the Sarnath school of Indian art. These are the images of uh, the river goddesses Ganga and Yamuna who also serve as doorkeepers and uh, they are located um, at the bottom of the door jam. And these are some of the other figures on the door jam. Uh, and the sculptural relief and uh, other architectural remains uh, lay scattered in the site. And uh, this is the place of worship where uh, devotees come uh, to visit the Shiva Linga and they light incense sticks and earthen lamps and make their offerings to the God. This uh, metal bell uh, which has been hung at the site is a recent addition. Uh, as is found in uh, most Indian Hindu temples, uh, metal uh, bells are rung by visitors because it is considered to be auspicious. So the heritage site is enclosed on all four sides by low brick walls and there is an office of uh, security cooperation. 
There is also an office of the Archaeological Survey of India (ASI), but which was closed when I visited the site recently and which looked like it has not been opened in a long time. There were visitors to the site who were leaving when I reached. The overall natural surroundings of the archaeological remains is well maintained, uh, lush greenery, but the actual historical objects seem to have been left to be handled by the general public. The Shiva Lingam, which is an, an iconic representation of the Hindu deity Shiva, stands in a sanctum sanctorum. It has been wrapped by a red cloth and offerings in the form of flowers, earth and lamps, food and even money has been made to it. These are recent activities, as is fairly evident from the freshness of the offerings. Thus, a heritage site with archaeological remains which go back to the 6th, 7th uh, century CE is still being actively used for the same purpose for which it was built. There has also been hung a metal belt, which I already um, have shown, uh, which is always present in Hindu temples. The ringing of this bell by devotees is believed to produce an auspicious sound. This bell at the site under consideration too is a recent addition. Such usage of a site is heartening from one point of view, that is, it is still in use for what, uh, for, for what it was originally constructed. In that way, it can be considered a living tradition or a living history which goes back to many centuries. It can be fascinating to study and imagine the various changes that have undergone in the use of such sites over the years, instead of barricading it preventing people from coming close and being in touch with it or carrying away specimens from such a site to a museum or a gallery where it becomes even more unreachable for people, the dog poverty site can be said to be a still operating historical site. This also ensures that people will keep visiting this site even if only for religious concerns. But uh, won't that also ensure that they are making history in the process besides learning about the site no matter how little? It must also be mentioned here that this site belongs to the current worshippers as much as it does to conservators as well as the people who were involved in its production several hundred years ago. However, it is known for a fact that uh, most Indian Hindu temples are not the neatest of sites and thus the Daaparvatiya site can seem like a conservator's nightmare. The sanctum sanctorum surrounding the lingam is layered with materials used for worship including oil and soot. The ground is blackened and covered with oil and other materials such as flowers, leaves, eatables, matchsticks, remains of incense sticks, etc. And due to exposure to the lighting of earthen lamps, the lower portions of the Ganga and Yamuna reliefs is covered with black soot and have uh, made it almost beyond recognition. There are also marks of vermilion on some of the reliefs as it is a custom to apply vermilion on the foreheads of people and the statue of deities in Hinduism. The remains from the pavilion in the form of stone slabs have been arranged in the form of seats. This might have been done to facilitate visitors and devotees to the site. Besides the stone slabs, there are also other relief sculptures and pillars which lay scattered in a pavilion. There are also large stacks of bricks dating back to the Ahom period in the area. These objects lay exposed to human and environmental factors and thus uh, risk of deterioration is always there. All the care and supervision undertaken by the ESI authorities seem to extend to only the area surrounding the actual site, that is the lawn and the walls enclosing the site. But the exposure of such historical objects to natural and human factors is not something unique to this site. This can even be seen in many Indian museums where lawns often feature sculptures without any enclosure or protection for their preservation. Coming back to all the oil, grime and soot accumulated at the site and its objects, can this be considered to be ethnographical dirt, that is um, dirt collected due to the original use of the object? And uh, if these are cleaned, will it really be considered to be an act of restoration or repair? Moreover, such acts of cleaning will have temporary effect because the site is still an active temple and worshippers will continue coming here for religious purposes. Also, cleaning of objects is not governed by the museum ethical code, but by the requirements of the users or the owners of the object. The site contains both uh, utilitarian objects, example the uh, Shiva Lingam, and the objects for decorative or religious purposes, example the reliefs of the Dojam. The word repair is used for utilitarian objects and the word restoration for decor decorative or religious purposes, but the difference is considered to be uh, minor. 
Cleaning as an act of restoration can remove parts of the object which has developed because of the utilization of the object. Such removal can compromise the integrity of the object. It is even more contestable because the results of such actions are usually irreversible. Although the Dog Parvatiya site is under the authority of the ESI, it is clearly actively utilized more by the general public. In any case, heritage is the asset of mankind and the public should have as much say in the conservation of the site as much as any art historian or archaeologist or conservator. According to the UKIC guidance for conservation practice, nothing should be removed from an object without sufficient evidence that it is not part of the original condition of the object. Even though the removal of corrosion products is ethically acceptable to UKIC, will our appreciation of a historical site or object be deficient if these deteriorative products were not removed, or will it enhance our understanding of the site even more? It is usually the kind of object that determines the requirements of the curators or the conservators, and it is usually their views which are considered. But expectations of the public should also be considered. This will be more problematic when the views of the public and the associates of the conservators do not coincide. Moreover, the public might also have expectations from the restorer themselves. A public relations campaign in order to spread awareness about what is being done to the historical object or site and why will aid in arriving at a mutual decision. Thus, as is evident, conservation processes should not only consider the shape of the object, they should also take into account the changes that will occur in the chemical and physical composition of the object. Moreover, the value attributed to the object and by whom is also crucial when considering conservation, most of the processes uh, of which are irreversible. It is usually the people who are directly involved in the discovery, collection and care of such artworks or artifacts whose conservation is considered expertise and is valued, but dialogue between them and the public to whom cultural heritage is supposed to also belong is very crucial. Conservation is thus not just the scientist's domain to be carried out with only empirical data. It can involve contestations, discussions, emotions and values among a wide range of people. Thank you.